to see you this morning. Everybody online joining us, glad you're back with us. Raise your hand if you want to hear a word from God today. You came to hear a word from God so you can have an encounter with God, so you can be changed, right? You didn't come to hear from me. You came to hear from, from God. So I'm going to read some scripture. I'm going to share a message that God put on my heart. Last week, if you missed last week, we talked about how to serve like Jesus. We read scripture, how Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and then he tells them, don't serve me, go serve other people, right? So I hope you've had some good opportunities to, to serve other people this past week, and you, and you just did what Jesus uh, told us to do. I'm excited about today's message because a couple weeks ago, about four in the morning, I woke up and I had this vision of Jesus on a boat and the boat was in a storm. And I knew, okay, Matthew 28. So I woke up and I began to study Matthew 28 and that's where we're going to be hanging out today. If you have your Bibles, you can join us there or pull out your Bibles on your phone. Okay, but the story of Matthew 28 picks up right after Jesus just finishes teaching to this giant crowd, right? So he's teaching this big crowd, right? And he's exhausted, but he gets on a boat and he gets a little distance between him and the crowd so he can keep preaching. But there comes a point, and it's amazing that the Son of God gets exhausted, right? So he lays down in the boat. But you gotta remember, Jesus is fully human. So you can't ever say, well, Jesus, you don't know what I'm going through. He knows exactly what you're going through. He's tired, and he lays down to sleep, right? And uh, while he's sleeping, we know this giant storm in Matthew 28, this giant storm, it rises up while he's sleeping. You see, Jesus didn't fear the wind or the waves. Why would the creator fear something he created? Amen? Amen. Jesus doesn't freak out like we freak out sometimes, right? He's not scared about this. He, he created the earth and the wind and the water and everything in it. So he doesn't lose sleep on the count of bad weather. You ever lost some sleep because it got stormy outside? Remember who creates everything, all right? So look at Matthew 28, verse 23, if you have your Bibles. It says this, Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then the disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So Jesus is sleeping in the middle of this fierce storm. It says tempest. I looked up tempest means violent, windy storm. So big that it's creating, the wind is so strong, it's creating these waves that are splashing and, and starting to fill up the boat. You see, where were, the, where were the followers of Jesus? Well, Scripture said that they followed Jesus into the boat, so they were in the boat with Jesus Right? They just weren't understanding who Jesus was. You see, they were fully awake, but they weren't awakened to the reality of the magnitude of who Jesus was. Right? And that's what God is doing us for this today. Is God's going to awaken us to the magnitude of who he really is in our lives. Because sometimes we forget the disciples, they just forgot. And I wrote down this. The disciples wanted the benefit of Jesus saving them from the storm without the commitment of trusting Jesus in the storm. They wanted the benefit. They just didn't want to trust him because they had a choice, right? When we go through storms, there's a choice. There's a choice. So the Bible doesn't go into details what the disciples were saying to each other, but I bet there was a conversation that went something maybe like this. So picture the disciples over here, and Jesus is over there sleeping. I got him a nice little pillow, so he's resting. He's over there. The disciples are over here, and they're talking. They're having a conversation with each other. Hey, someone's got to go wake up Jesus, or we're going to perish. We're going to die if someone doesn't go do that. You know, and I wonder if Matthew, the tax collector, in the particular one, says, you know what, right now, it's a 60-mile-an-hour wind. These are eight-foot waves. Right now, there's 20 gallons of water per minute filling up this boat. We've got seven minutes till we die, fellas. I wonder if James says, Matthew, stop it with your nonsense, always calculating things. You see, here's the deal with calculation. When you calculate the facts of your storm, it takes your eyes off Jesus. And Matthew was calculating how often do we calculate the facts of the storm? We're not in denial of the storm in our life, whether it be your finances or your health, relationship, whatever storm is going on. But how about if we stop calculating and start having faith? Right? I wonder, I wonder if, uh, if Peter goes, you know, hey, guys, I, know, I don't know how much time. Do you want me to run into shore and, and grab a bigger boat? Because you all know I can walk on water, right? And I wonder if the disciples said, we've seen that, Peter. Yeah, you, you kind of suck at it. Right? So there's this conversation taking place, I think, on one end of the boat while Jesus continues his sleep. And we all know that Jesus might have been resting and sleeping, but he's fully aware of the storm and what his followers are doing. You see, Jesus fully aware of whether we choose to rest by him or panic when the, when the storms rise up in our life. Right? You see, Jesus wants us to learn how to rest in the storm and rest when there's no storm. See, resting by Jesus is for all seasons. Amen? 
All right? So number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus allows storms. Jesus allows storms in our life. And, and there's different storms that take place in different seasons of all our lives, but he allows them. Why did Jesus allow this particular storm with the disciples? Well, let's look back at verse 27 again. It said, the disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him, his word. So a couple things took place right there. Number one is, listen, the disciples woke up to the reality of the magnitude that they had God in the boat with them. And they've seen him do miracles, but they just weren't getting it yet. The light hadn't switched fully on on their minds of who was really in the boat with them, right? Who was in the boat? So Jesus allowed that storm to switch that light on so they would begin to realize, okay, I've got more than just someone that can heal people. He speaks to the waves. There's authority in this man that everything has to listen to him, amen? So there's revelation that takes place when we go through a storm. Sometimes you think, well, I caused that storm. Yeah, God can show up even when you cause your own storms in your life. There's other storms that happen when you had nothing to do with it, and a storm comes on you, right? It's attacked from the enemy. He's just pouring it on. Yeah, Jesus can do something about that storm in your life too. Amen? When I was 20, a storm blew into our family. You see, things shut down in college in California. Tanya, we had to transfer out of California, and we had to go to a different college uh, UCO there in Edmond offered me a scholarship. I knew three days in advance. We said we had baby Garrett was a little guy. We said bye to all our family, right? My, my, my mother-in-law's right there shaking her head. She's still probably mad at me, right? So we had, we had baby Garrett with us. We had $400 in our pocket. How many of you know when you move across country, that doesn't go very far? So I was a little concerned, but we had prayed about it, and I felt the Lord give me a peace, and I told John I really have a peace about moving to Oklahoma. You know, I don't know nothing about I thought the school was red and white. Well, they're blue and gold. That's how much I knew of UCO at the time, right? Okay, I just said there's a peace about this. So even though there's a peace about what we are to do, and it doesn't mean the storm left us. Tanya cried almost all the way out of here. I told her there was no gangs in Oklahoma, cowboy gangs. I was, that's what I said. We drove, we rolled up in Oklahoma City by the Capitol, and we saw it looked like someone that might have been in a gang. I don't know, but he didn't talk, and he started crying again. You said there's no gangs, right? So there was a storm still there, even though I knew that God gave me a peace about what to do. So you don't base your decision off what God says based off a storm. You base the decision off the anchor of God's word when he speaks into your life about something to do. Amen? Because the storm's not going to, you can have the peace of God in the middle of a storm. The storm doesn't determine if you've got peace. Isaiah 26, I'm going to read in a second, the peace comes from Jesus. Sometimes we chase the rabbit around of our life. If the storm will stop, they don't have peace. And Jesus is saying today, the storm doesn't determine your peace. I determine your peace. You can be in the storm and still have my peace. Sometimes we cry out to God, take, take the storm away. And I wonder if Jesus is saying, when you look at me, when you get your eyes back on me, I'm going to give you the, what you're looking for, and that's peace. Amen. So number one, God allows storms in our lives to reveal the magnitude of who he is. Number two, of resting like Jesus is we got to stand on the word. we got to stand on the word of God. See, when you stand on the word of God, your foundation begins to get strong. Every day you're pouring the word of God in you. Your foundation is getting thicker because, listen, the, a storm is coming your way. You may be in the middle of one now, build that foundation. You may think there's peace, and you're going to take a break from the word of God. A storm is on its way. Those that have built on a strong foundation of the word, you're going to be still standing. I mean, let's take a look here. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. I mean, you've got to read it and do it, right? I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Amen? But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. So you can read it but not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. All because it determined back to the word of God. Your foundation is determined by, not, by the strength of, of the word of God in your life. How much have you put the word of God in your life? Notice the storm comes to everybody. Those that follow the word and those that don't follow the word, it comes to everybody, right? The question is, Will your foundation be strong enough for the word of God in your life to support when the storm comes? That's the question. But are you getting the word of you, the word of God in you daily? You see, when you, when you sow the word of God in your heart, listen to what will happen. It will start to germinate. It will sprout. Deep roots will go deep, right? So to, to stick you up, roots go in the ground to hold the tree there. Deep roots are going to grow as you're reading the word of God. And then also branches will start to come out and you'll begin to bear fruit. You can, do you know you can bear fruit in the storm? 
that good, God can do things in your life and things begin to change around you, even in a storm. Right? Look at Proverbs 12. It says this. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread. Till means prepare. What are you doing to prepare? A lot of times I say one of the ways you prepare is during worship. You're, you're, you're getting your, your eyes and your mind off yourself, and you're lifting up the king of kings. Amen. You're at, your heart is being tilled for the seed. When I read scripture, for the seed to be planted and grow. Okay, there's different ways you can till. Your quiet time, you're spending time with the Lord, worship time during the week. Right? You're tilling your heart so the seeds can grow. All right, number two of how to rest like Jesus is you got to imitate Jesus. And God tells us to imitate him. Look at Ephesians 5. Follow God's example. Imitate. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. You see, he loves you. He wants you to, he wants you to imitate him. So think about this. What storms are you currently in? Think about what storms you're Think about what that scripture just said. We're to imitate God. Well, what does Jesus do during storms? We know he, he sleeps. So he rests and he sleeps. He doesn't panic. The other thing is he uses his words, right? He uses his words. You see, when he spoke to the storm, the storm stopped. God's giving you full authority. God said you have all authority. Everybody say all. all. So when you speak to the storm and you speak with scripture, not your thinking, when you start to speak the word of God over the storm, and there's so many scriptures God's given us, pick one, and you, see, and you have faith in that scripture and the word of God, and you speak to the storm, the storm has to obey. Now, listen, it may not obey overnight. Well, God, I spoke it overnight. Listen, it, it, was over, it was instant with Jesus, but sometimes it could be a week or two weeks or a month. We don't understand why there's a duration when I'm starting to speak. God, I'm telling what you did. Pastor Terry said, speak to the storm, and I'm speaking to the storm, but it's still there. What is God doing in you? How about you don't miss the fact that he may be trying to do something in you? Amen? Look at verse 26. It says this, and he arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there's a great calm. He just spoke to the storm. Maybe you're thinking, I get it. You know, he's God and I'm human. Well, remember, Jesus was fully human. He chose to step down out of heaven and be fully human. He's fully God, but he's also fully human. Okay? Now, Jesus was sleeping. And I wonder what would have happened if one of the disciples in the middle of the storm, listen, if one of the disciples over here, all the disciples are panicking, the storm's going on, Jesus is sleeping. If just one of the disciples said, you know what, listen, the one that created all the storms and all the things in this whole world, he's over there sleeping, and he looks like he's sleeping like a baby. And we're panicking over here. And I wonder if the story was just a little different in the chapter, it ended just a little different, but what if one of the disciples said, you know what, I think I'm going to go lay down by Jesus. I wonder what the other disciples might have said. I wonder if they'd have said something like, you know, um, that's your answer? <laughs> that's your answer? You're going to go take a nap when we're about to die? That's what you're going to do? Yeah, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. Well, you know, when you go to make decisions of faith, other Christians may, may not even understand it. Not everybody will get it when you take steps of faith. Change jobs, move towns. Not everybody gets it. So let's picture this disciple. And he, he walks over here and he decides, you know what? I got to get out of that end of the boat. That end of the boat stressing me out. <laughs> I'm going to lay down here by Jesus for a second. Jesus, hey. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake you, Jesus. I'm trying to be quiet, but you see my friends down there, Jesus, they're panicking. And they're stressing me out. And I'm not going to lie, I'm a little concerned too. The storm's big. And it looks like we're going to die, Jesus. And I wonder if Jesus would have said something like this, you know. I've been waiting for just one. I've been over here, I've been awake. You thought I was sleeping, I'm chilling. I'm just waiting. I got room on this pillow for one more person. I said, who, which one's going to join me? So I'm so glad you joined me because you see, if one will come and, and show faith in me, I believe the others it will activate something in them. And I want all of them. I want all of them. But I've been waiting for you. Man, Jesus, it sure is peaceful here. I could, I could stay here. Take me a nap. It's peaceful up here, Jesus. He goes, yeah, you know the scripture, Terry, Isaiah 26, 3 says, those who keep their eyes on me will have peace. Yeah, that's good, Jesus. Man, I just feel you. What, you see, when you're by Jesus, you're going to receive what's inside him. See, what's inside you What's inside somebody else? When I'm around somebody and I spend a lot of time with Jesus and I begin to minister in their life, I'm just giving away Jesus. What you have, you give away. You ever been around somebody that's panicking? They, you can tell they haven't been with Jesus because you give away what you have, right? So in this moment, we all have a decision to make. I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a decision to make in the storm of my life to go lay down by Jesus. I could have stayed on this end of the boat. Remember, God's given you a will, a free will to choose. He doesn't make robots. He gives us will because he wants us to choose. Forced love is not love. 
He wants us to choose to lay down by him. So I want you to get a visual today. Whatever storm you're in or when a storm comes, picture this message that Pastor Terry said that I'm going to choose to lay down by Jesus in the boat. And when I try to look look around and get, because he had a choice, right? I had a choice. I could have looked. At one point I said, Jesus, I, I feel the boat moving. I know the storm's still going on, but it sure is peaceful down here. I have a choice. I can choose to, to look at the storm or I can choose to follow Jesus. This morning I was just in here praying and God reminded me to, of another scripture to add to the message. So this is Matthew. Ryan, you don't have it. Don't worry about it. Here it is right here. It's, it's Matthew. This is earlier. This is Matthew 17. Remember, this is before all the storms. So all the disciples have seen a lot of stuff before this. So Jesus goes to, uh, goes to the top of a mountain with a couple of disciples and as we call the transfiguration, right, the, the power of the Father, the glory of the Father ascended on Jesus, right, and he began to light up, right, transfiguration. So he has an encounter with God on top of the mountain. And Jesus walks down, verse 14, it says, at the foot of the mountain. So Jesus is walking down. He just had this major encounter with the Father. A large crowd is waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or in the, into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Then Jesus rebuked the demon. Remember, he's using his words. He rebuked the demon and the boy, and it left him. Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could, have, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would have, it'd have to move. Nothing would be impossible. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Nothing's impossible for you. Listen. There's a, there was a storm. Jesus has an encounter with God. The kingdom of God shows up on top of the mountain. He comes down, and the kingdom of God shows up at the bottom of the mountain. Right When someone gets healed or set free or someone gets saved, the kingdom of God just showed up in that moment. So the kingdom of God shows up to this, this father that he's seen his son throw himself in the fire. You ever Imagine watching your own son jump in the water to drown himself. You want something to happen. Lord, I need you. You know they were telling him, quit bothering Jesus. He's up there having an encounter with the Father. Leave him alone. But this dad, had he didn't, he didn't care. He needed an encounter with Jesus. He needed it. He wasn't going to let other people talk him out of it. right? So he has this encounter with Jesus. And I want to say it differently. Jesus has said it's never been about the mountain. It's always been about the man. Sometimes we get impressed by the mountain when it's always been about the man. Will you stare at the man? Will you stare at the mountain or will you stare at the man? Because you have a choice. The man is the one that can save you. The mountain just overwhelms you. The, the disciples, they were staring at the storm. That was a mountain. They got impressed by the storm. And when you stare at the storm too long, what happens? A spirit of fear. God says a, a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear was affecting them. How often we've given the enemy legal right for a, a, an oppressive spirit to mess with us because we stare at the mountain instead of stare at the man. It's all about the man. All about him. And I wonder if Jesus might have said something like this. Um, you don't know this yet. But in John 16, 33, I'm going to use, I'm going to use him to pin what I'm going to say. And Jesus might have said I, this in John 16, verse 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. When you got saved, it doesn't mean you're never going to have trouble. But take heart. That means be encouraged because I've overcome the world. Look at, or maybe Jesus might have said, you know, hey, let's talk about Romans 15. You haven't read this yet, but this is what's coming in the future. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, God wants you overflowing with hope, right? Why does he want, because I, I want hope to overflow out of me and land on Pat or on Bobby or on Kent. I want them to be inspired by the Jesus in me, amen? Today during worship practice, I was up there just praying, and I saw the whole worship team, but Casey in particular, he was so full of joy. I told him, I'm going to make him a shirt that says, Joy for Jesus, because he's so full of joy, it's contagious. It was spilling out on the rest of the team, right? What you have in you, you give away, right? You can be filled. It's amazing that you can fill with perfect peace and, and hope, even in a storm. Point number four is this. Don't laugh, but this is what I, God gave me. Don't be a peeker. Don't be a peeker. This is one of Satan's biggest tricks. You see, here's the deal. He wants you, listen, he wants you to, to, to not lay down by Jesus. He wants you to sit up and go, you know what? It sure is windy out there. He wants you to lean over the edge and peek at the storm. You see, because if he can get you looking at the storm, 
That means your eyes are no longer in Jesus. And Jesus is the one that can give you peace. This one gives you fear. This one gives you peace. The devil wants you to be a peeker. We're not in denial that the storm's still there. I've just made a conscious decision. Father, even in my finances, even in my marriage, even with my kids, one of my kids has wandered off. I'm staying locked in on you because you're the one that can bring peace, peace to my situation. The storm just gets me wound up and panicky. But you're the one that gives me peace. Picture you're in the boat. This time it's you, you're laying down by Jesus. And Jesus knows you're in a storm. He's not caught off guard by the storms in your life. Nothing gets Jesus caught off guard, right? And you want to get, a, you just want a little peek. And Jesus is saying, don't look. Stay locked on me. Don't look. The storm's not going anywhere because I, I tell the storm when his time's up. Amen? The storm's going to be there until I teach you what I want to teach you. I want to sometimes if we're in storms longer than we're supposed to be in it because we're kind of hard-headed. And we're, God's saying, oh, another day, another day, another week, another month. Until we get the lessons he's trying to teach us, we could be in that storm. Could be. Not always the case, but sometimes it is. But Jesus is saying, if you keep your thoughts on me and not on the ways of life, I'm going to give you peace. Look at Isaiah 26, 3. This is just a verse that's been, been on me for about two or three months now. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Can you trust in Jesus? Can you keep your mind on him? Because if you keep your mind on him, he says perfect peace. Everybody say perfect. Perfect, because here's the, here's the reality. I think sometimes we settle for just a little peace. When God says, I have perfect peace available for you, sometimes we read the word a little bit or we sing a couple songs and then we get more focused on the storm. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. But there's perfect peace for those that keep their eyes locked in on Jesus. Do you understand the devil is always about distractions? He wants you distracted, distracted with things in your life. Nothing's ever going to be perfect, by the way, right? As soon as you solve one storm, another storm will pop up because that's how it works. So you can choose to be distracted, 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 or you can choose to be locked in on the one that rests. And when you stay locked on him, man, peace is coming. This is not wishful thinking. This is the word of God. It's a promise. This is one of his many promises. There's 32,000 promises in the Bible. This is one of them. Remember when Peter was walking on water, he, he was doing great, right? His eyes were on Jesus. He was locked in on the one that had the authority. And then he got a little scared by the wind and the waves, and he looked down. As soon as he looked down, he began to sink, right? He started falling in the water. Of course, Jesus is full of grace. He reached out. Aren't you thankful for he has grace for us? And he picks him back up. I just want to encourage you today, whatever storm you're in, when you get a little water splashing out, the boat's starting to fill up, don't get up and panic. Don't peek over the side. Stay on, locked on the one that can bring peace into your situation. Amen? He's the peacemaker. You see, the outside environment doesn't change the peace that's in him. He's not impressed by the environment. Remember, he's the creator of all things. Right? Spiritually, what you focus on will become your reality. Whatever you focus on will become the reality in your life. If you focus on the problem, watch that problem rise. If you focus on the Savior, watch that problem shrink and peace comes back. That's just a, that's a pr spiritual principle of it, right? As we mature in Christ, I think we're able to, I can rest a lot differently now than I used to when I was just 30, right? I can rest a lot more. A lot of times I'm, I'm resting by Jesus because I have, I think all of us, we want to go lay down by Jesus and we do good and the boat starts to shake a little and we start to set up and look, Right? As you grow in the, with the Lord, you'll learn how to discipline yourself to lay down more. doesn't mean you're perfect. But I'm a lot different than I was when I was 30. I spent a lot of time with the Lord. Look at Psalm 27. It says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You see, you can make it to heaven with empty hands, but why would you want to? Why not go instead with crowns of faith that lay at his feet? Jesus, when I was 20 years old, didn't know what I was doing. No one really gave us a chance. Everybody thought we'd be back in California in about three months. We wouldn't last out here. But Jesus, you showed up, and I take a crown of faith of God how faithful he is, and I get to set it down at his feet when I get to heaven. How about Jesus, when my finances look terrible, and I begin to tithe because preacher said tithe, and you're going to read scripture, and I knew it was the right thing to do, and I start tithing when things didn't look good, you showed up and began to bless me. I want to lay that crown down at your feet. What about Jesus, my son that wandered away, and I kept praying for him, praying for him. It's been two years. It's been three years. He came back. The prodigal son came back. I want to lay that crown at Jesus' feet. 
Why would you want to go to heaven with empty hands when you could go with crowns of faith to lay at his feet? But it's amazing the word that God's given us today. Can you rest in the boat with him? He's in the boat with you. You can Listen, God is in the boat in your life. God was in the boat with those disciples and they weren't aware of it. Right? God's in your personal boat right now with you all the time. If you're in a storm right now, I just want to encourage you, don't stand on that end being impressed by the storm. Discipline yourself to go lay down by him. We're not ignoring the storm. We're just focused on the one that has authority over the storm. Amen? Look at John 15 as I, as I close. God says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Listen, abide means you're staying with somebody. You're not leaving them. Regardless of the situation, I'm stuck with you, Jesus, in a, in a way spiritually that I'm, I'm, not, I'm making a decision not to leave you. And think about this as the last scripture here. It's just John 12. Where do you find Jesus' servants? It says, where I am, there my servant will be also. Will you stick with Jesus? He's closer than a friend. He's your father. He's your friend. Let's pray. I just say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you during this message? I know some of you are in storms right now. You're facing some big storms in your life. There's things that are unsure and it's uncomfortable. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? Remember, Jesus is in the boat with you. Will you make a decision today? Jesus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest by you. My eyes are going to be on you. You're the one that brings me peace, not the storm. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And the storms of this life are tossing you around. I mean, beating you up. Jesus is here and he's offering you an opportunity to, to have a relationship with him. Will you do that today? It's really simple. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that I am Lord, you shall be saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right now I'm offering you that. You can just, very simple, just slip your hand up and say, Lord, I, I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. Anybody today want to ask Jesus into their heart? Very simple. You can just slip your hand up. Father, I just thank you so much for the word you've given us today that you've reminded us, Lord, the storms that we're in, that we're to lay down and just rest by you. That our minds would be on you, Lord. Help us to be a group of people, Father, that are focused on you. We're determined to stay looking at you. Even when there's distractions that pop up in our walks, things that don't look good or feel good, we, we recognize them, we pray over them, but we're staying focused on you. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, our, our prayer team's going to come up here in just a second in this last song. And I just pray that if, if you're feeling tugged to come up to get prayed with, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I believe he's moving right now. He answers prayers. We've seen a lot of prayers be answered up here at the altar. So we're going to stand. If you need